I'm I'm unmuted now. Thank you so much, Walter. Uh, give me one second. I will share my screen. And all right, I think this works. <clears throat> right? Okay. Um, so um, so I'm excited to share um, the the results of this research. Um, the the data itself was collected uh, several years ago, to be honest. Uh, but we started working on it together as a class in one of my graduate seminars here at Wayne State, and I'm I'm excited to to that that that's my you know to co-author. Anytime you co-author with your students, it always gives you a rush, and and that was no different for me this time. Um, this uh, this research uh, actually got published this past year at the end of last year, actually in this wonderful volume called Mental Health Among Higher Education Faculty, Administrators, and Graduate Students is um, available through Rutledge. So I, I strongly encourage everyone to go check it out uh, because there are some really uh, wonderful chapters in, in this book. Um, so what I'm gonna be talking about today is a part of um, the, the over, uh, a part of the data uh, the findings from this overall project. We actually have another manuscript, which is uh, due for revision for a journal, uh, but uh, we were glad that you know, the part that I'm talking to you about today got published in this book. So in terms of a quick overview, um, I'm gonna go over the study rationale, the literature review and theoretical framework that is probably most relevant to our project, the method and the findings, and just uh, discuss some major takeaways uh, both pragmatic and theoretical from from this from this work. Um, oh, and yes, I'm going to be using a lot of uh, comic strips from PhD Comics. So if if you are not familiar with PhD Comics, although these days I think everyone really is, um, you will probably agree with me that um, it sort of leaves this bittersweet sensation in in your heart uh, because you recognize some of the. Um, some of the uh, sensations, some of the vignettes that they paint, uh, but you know, almost feel horrible for recognizing them at the same time. So, uh, without further ado, why are why did we do this study? Right. Uh, well, we did it because I think we all recognize that graduate students are under severe mental health stress, and long before the pandemic, uh, you know, reared its head in two thousand and twenty. Um, and these uh, issues related to mental health um, are not necessarily only because, um, are, are not necessarily because, you know, um, of the, they're not able to do the work, but, you know, in most cases they are more than able to do the work, but really because of um, arguably a lot of these stressful conditions and discourses and structures that they find themselves in, that we, uh, uh, faculty and administrators, often impose on, on graduate students. Uh, the prospect of post-PhD careers in a lot of fields also is not the best, uh, to be honest. And so, of course, the, you know, for a lot of graduate students, uh, the, the question naturally pops up, well, what am I doing all this for, right? Um, and while there's been a lot of really wonderful data, I think, at the macro level, which looks at stressors and conditions and um, out, career outcomes for graduate students, uh, we noticed that there really hasn't been a lot of uh, projects that have taken a more situated approach to understanding, A, how disciplinary norms and practices might contribute to these stressful conditions, and B, um, really looking at um, just the uh, just the stories that people share, right? And how these different stories can really uh, potentially, um, you know, address, uh, create and suggest possible solutions. So, so that's why we sort of take this um, situated, uh, situated look at the lived experiences of graduate students in my home discipline of communication, which is really why the National Communication Association uh, was happy to fund us. So, <clears throat> What do we do? Um, well, first of all, you know, we, we sort of ad, 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 adopt um, a professional, if you will, look at a professional, if you will, perspective at thinking about academia and higher education. We, we uh, take this perspective that 
graduate school is not just school. It is a laboratory for preparation into the profession of higher, of higher education. You learn how to be a faculty member um, and you learn the work norms as well as the expectations um, that uh, faculty members um, have for other uh, new colleagues. So we really drew from the research in organizational and anticipatory socialization to really understand how graduate students' professional identity as well as their career expectations are formed um, through their graduate school experiences. We also drew from uh, interdisciplinary work on the meaningfulness of work. Um, and the meaningfulness of work framework really basically argues that how people make meaning of the work that they engage in uh, is, is affected by the circulation of various messages that they encounter, both societally as well as at their workplace, these memorable messages. Um, there are broader cultural and societal discourses with a capital D in the sense, in the Foucauldian sense, um, recognizing that these various discourses do also have uh, really um, significant power relations inbuilt within them. And uh, recognizing also that how people find meaning in their work is also influenced by the available rules and the resources that they find within their institutions. Um, finally, we also looked at research on social support and social and, and, and stress and coping. I see my uh, department chair, Kat McGuire is over here. So Kat can tell you that, you know, social support can be wonderful in terms of buffering stress and, and coping. At the same time, core rumination, uh, where there's too much perhaps venting and not necessarily trying to address solutions uh, or solutionary approaches, can actually exacerbate a lot of this anxiety and this depression and, and really just make people feel like uh, they're just stuck in a bad situation and there's no way out. And, and, and believe me, that is not a position um, anybody wants to be in. Um, so while we drew on this broad literature, we also drew on uh, structuration theory, which, uh, which uh, of course, Anthony Giddens' work, as well as his, uh, his disciplinary descendants, his interdisciplinary descendants, who really look, talked about the duality of structure, recognizing that social structures, institutional structures, they condition as well as constrain the actions of agents. Um, agency is very much still available and there, but uh, there is this ongoing dance, if you will, that structure and agency engages in together. And, and thinking about how this applies in academic settings, uh, we wanted to really look at these intersections of structure and action across the macro level, the meso level, as well as the micro levels that shape graduate students' lived experience. So we wanted to look at those intersections between academia and the, and the cultural discourses and expectations about academia in general, uh, along with the um, more specific rules and resources that exist in units such as colleges, areas, as well as departments, um, and how they also draw from, but also uh, shape uh, interpersonal interactions and relationships um, on the ground level or the micro level. So uh, in, in, in other words, we really wanted to look at how various cultural and institutional norms uh, can shape and are impacted by organizational structures, which in turn also impact everyday norms, policies, and procedures. And we also recognized, guided by structuration theory, that as a result of this interaction, these norms, policies, and procedures can either be reproduced, where you have more of the same thing, or they can be transformed um, to, to differing degrees, of course, depending on this um, intersection of structure and action. So with that broad theoretical overview in place, what did we try to look at in this study? Um, our, our research question was, was quite simple, really. How do graduate school structures and processes contribute to communication graduate student stress? I love Toy Story, but I've only seen the first three. <laughs> uh, so what did we do in terms of our, our methods? <clears throat> 
this is an entirely qualitative study. And so we reached out to uh, do in-depth interviews with 50 masters and PhD students in communication graduate programs in the United States. And all of these interviews were conducted by phone and Skype. Um, it was a combination of purposive and snowball sampling. So the National Communication Association has a listserv called ComNotes, and it also maintains a pretty exhaustive list of all the graduate programs in communication in the, in the country, as well as who their chairs and their departments are. And we really utilize both the listserv as well as this program list to essentially send out several email blasts. We ended up with a sample that was more or less about 35 uh, uh, female and 15 male identifying students, 28 PhD students and 22 master students. And you know, roughly we spent about 33 minutes uh, with, with the average time for each of these interviews. We ended up with a lot of data, um, about 608 pages of data amounting to around 23 hours of interview time. Uh, and then we started going through all of this data using Kathy Sharmazes, who recently passed away, uh, her version of const uh, her constructivist version of grounded theory, which which I love because it sort of helps you look at the intersections and the nuances of between and betwixt those themes, um, rather than necessarily um, imposing a sort of artificial form of order. Uh, so we had three uh, coders. And then uh, Patrice and I, we, we worked with Nubia and Julia and, and Liz um, to, to address any questions they might have had, any questions that really emerged over the coding process, to just clarify the theory uh, for ourselves um, and, and essentially then sort of uh, create this sort of story that emerged from the data. So, <laughs> Uh, so what did we find from the data? Well, first of all, let's look at the macro level. And as I, as I go through the different levels to get together, I'm going to try to show you how these levels also intersect. So on the macro level, um, we found the prevalence of publish or perish discourses, right? Uh, and graduate students know that they, they're, they're held to these expectations um, of publish or perish. Um, and uh, surprise, surprise, it doesn't necessarily lead to um, uh, feelings of empowerment. In fact, it rarely did. Uh, most of the time, publish or perish led to feeling that you were stuck in this toxic, hyper-competitive environment, and whatever you did was simply not going to be enough. So these feelings of inadequacy were, were really rampant. Um, graduate students also reported how uh, when faculty members were so preoccupied with so-called incommensurability uh, issues within their field, um, and they wanted to find a sort of pure way of doing communication research, um, that uh, they sort of tended to downplay other alternative ways of thinking about their discipline or social phenomena, that often resulted in you know, really hostile environments and interdepartmental tensions, which really spilled over into criticizing um, graduate students' work. You know, if you did not feel that this work necessarily reflected your own perspective of how communication uh, should, should be studied. So field level incommensurability, I still trip over that word, uh, Thomas Kuhn. Uh, <laughs> I still sit over that word, but um, it, it's, and, and, and although it's a mouthful to pronounce, I think it has, um, unfortunately, not a happy legacy in terms of how scholar, uh, scholars really feel on the ground when they're doing scholarship. The last major theme from the macro level was really recognizing that although a lot of departments um, and universities paid lip service to diversity and, and aggressively recruited uh, students of color. Unfortunately, um, on the ground, there was little meaningful investment in terms of training or, um, in, or, or even just acknowledgement of diverse experiences and how diverse experiences would translate into different forms and expectations of scholarship. And so the little meaningful investment 
really meant that a lot of graduate students felt really alienated within these departments that um, initially they had such high hopes for. So I'm gonna show you a couple of examples from Dottie and Penelope, and um, these are uh, uh, fictional names. So Dottie, for instance, talks about the incommensurability part. Uh, and she talks about being in a program um, where uh, she really felt that her qualitative critical uh, approach was actively devalued. And she says, the problem isn't so much that they're doing quantitative work. I think the problem is that they don't have too much sympathy towards qualitative work or even an understanding of it. There's no way to have them on my committee and have a supportive committee. I just have a committee that is squabbling. Um, and, and so you can see how that incommensurability aspect really plays out in, in, in unhealthy ego-oriented ways um, with that unfortunately the, the most precarious actor, the graduate student bears the brunt off in, in these situations. Penelope talked about um, how she thought that, I just thought this was going to be this idealistic place where there were so many brown critical people. I got here and it was all white. It was very pretentious. It was very upsetting. I had folks tell me uh, in my cohort that they thought that I was a minority admission. They said that therefore I didn't really belong in the same ways that they did. I get, got in on some kind of social advantage that they got in on the merit of their work. It's not just once that I heard it. I wish the program had more of a recognition of that and addressed it instead of pretending that it doesn't exist. I have to tell you that, you know, every time, I mean, when, when, I, when I did these interviews and whenever I go back to looking at the data, I, I really do feel a profound sense of sadness. Um, I mean, it, it, it is really heartbreaking to, to, to hear and read some of these stories. And, and, you know, my hat, I'm not wearing a hat right now, but if I were, I would, I would definitely tip my hat off to these amazing of, uh, students who really share their stories. Um, at the meso level, and the meso level is more about what's really happening at the departmental institutional level, right? <clears throat> um, Department politics, and you can see how we, we talked a little bit about politics in the macro level, and you can see how you know, that sort of uh, reemerges in, in this, in terms of these interactions at the meso departmental level as well. And, and graduate students, you know, directly high said that, you know, that th this contributes to a hostile work environment that they found it really difficult to work in. They also talked about how um, even, there even if there wasn't, you know, um, you know tensions between, uh, between faculty members, a lot of departments they, they talked about had really unclear policies. And they weren't quite sure how crucial decisions related to funding, course assignments, teaching assignments, um, assignments for summer, um, and, and so on and so forth, were really even picked and selected. So there was a lack of transparency that they identified. And they also identified that when, there's this, when there is this lack of transparency, it allows personal grudges that maybe some faculty members have towards other faculty members or their advisees to go relatively unchecked. It also means that you know, when a decision has been taken that uh, is fairly opaque because there is, uh, there, there's very little formal recourse that the graduate student can even take uh, in such a situation to even find out why this decision was made. They also talked about the inadequacy or the irrelevancy of resources. And, and, and I wanna highlight inadequate or, or, or irrelevant because several graduate students said, well, yes, our university has all of these different resources, but they're not necessarily resources that someone in my position finds useful. They're not meant for people like me. And so some of the, uh, so as I go through, as you see these different resources highlighted over here, it's, it's valuable to realize that you know, resources have to be targeted as well. So not all graduate students will want, uh, will, will want uh, uh, resources for say funding or professional development or pedagogical training, or I shouldn't say want, or you know, some might find some of these resources more important than others. I think that's probably a better way of framing it. But these are valuable resources 
that a lot of our participants really found wanting uh, within their departments um, and within their institutions. In some cases, they, they recognize also that the institution might have these resources, but because they were not adequately encouraged um, or, or publicized within their departments, uh, for all intents and purposes, they found out that these resources existed probably you know, two years or three years into uh, their, their, their work, which wasn't very helpful. Finally, a lack of useful and compassionate mentorship. Um, and I, I want to be very clear over here that, that it wasn't necessarily a bunch of students saying, oh, my faculty is horrible and he doesn't care for me or she doesn't care for me. A lot of times, although to be honest, there were quite a few horrible and um, uh, stories that I heard. So I don't want to say that those were not there either. But there were a lot of situations when, when graduate students said, you know, my, my faculty advisor isn't able to be there for me. And I kind of understand why, because they are just burned out. Um, or they, uh, they have these uh, ideas about incommensurability and what kind of a doc student I should work with. And so they look at me and they say, no, there's not a good fit over here. And so she says, yes, I'm, 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 I'm admitted into the program, but once I'm admitted into the program, I find it really difficult to work with more than just one or two people on any projects. So I'll, I'll give you an example over here. This is one extended example uh, from someone I'll call Shar. <clears throat> and uh, this example, I think, sort of shows how a lot of these teams are actually nested together. So for instance, uh, despite institutional directives to value diversity, inadequate funding and other resources such as mentoring often accompanied other departmental practices such as unclear policies and racial stereotyping. So one example uh, of stereotyping, for example, occurred when international students were asked to teach intercultural communication classes, despite no subject training in, in, that, in that class. Um, and just because they were of non-US country of origin. So for instance, Shar felt that stereotyping played a role in her perception of the discrimination that she experienced. So she said that her department routinely asked international students to teach cross-cultural and intercultural communication while her American born counterparts did not have the same request. Um, and so you see that in, her, in this quotation from her, she says, so people who did have a background who were not international students were passed over and people who were international students were given those kinds of classes to teach. So that was an interesting thing that happened, she says, um, which, which really hurts all sorts of students in this kind of a situation. Um, also, I want to uh, acknowledge that she explained that she attempted to speak with faculty about her lack of experience in intercultural theory, but faculty softly told her that she was eligible to teach the course simply because she was an international student. So she says, basically, I went and talked to people who were supposed to be giving these things out, made these positions. And I basically said that I did not have any experience in teaching this kind of stuff. So they basically talked about, they did not refer to my international status, but they basically said that depending on the needs of the department, we thought you were the best person to teach. <laughs> I think we've all heard this. Uh, the, I mean, the vagueness is just astounding, but it's 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 a form of strategic ambiguity, which unfortunately is utilized to sort of justify these kinds of um, non-transparent decision-making practices, needs of the department, without sp actually spelling out how this uh, these decisions are really made. Let's talk about the micro-level findings. Um, well, and generally the micro level is primarily more about the interactions. And so it's more about the actual manifestation of, of stress, right? And so over here, for instance, we found that graduate students really highlighted the toxic hyper competition uh, around them and, they, and which, which did result in fragmentation and division within their own cohort, right? So not really that sort of cohort experience that uh, is idealized, I think. Uh, they talked about envy within their cohort. And they also talked about disconnection, social disconnection from each other, from their department, from their institution, and 
from their um, from their faculty members as well, which also resulted in insecurity, um, insecurity both at a professional level um, and also personal insecurity because. I think a lot, all of us, a, a, a lot of us in, in higher education tend to, I think, feel very strongly about what we do. It becomes an integral part of our, of our personal so, identity. And so it, it stands to reason that professional insecurity would also lead to personal insecurity about you know, their own feelings of adequacy and, 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 and capacity. In this case, we found a lot of graduate students talking about, you know, how they felt very insecure about their own teaching and research expertise, even though they might, you know, really know the subject matter inside out, um, that the interactions around them made them really constantly second guess themselves, like Cecilia over here in this cartoon. Um, leading many of our graduate students who actually did abandon the projects dear to them. You know, if, if, if their faculty or, or committee members often told them, nope, this is not something that you should be working on, or it's not uh, theoretical enough, or it doesn't look at a, a community that is underserved enough. <laughs> um, it, it led many to abandon these projects, or in some cases to disengage emotionally completely from their work and from the institution, and of course, leave academia altogether. Um, so overall, we, we start seeing a lot of disconnection, resentment, anxiety, also due to unchecked tokenism and stereotyping um, and a lack of meaningful personal ties. So I'll show you some examples of this as well. Um, and these examples come from two of our participants, Grace and Fergie. <clears throat> so Grace says, you realize that even though there are these people who should be like-minded, she's talking about her cohort members, and just love to learn and love to make new discoveries, that there's still a whole lot of ego involved, that you're still going to deal with people who treat others poorly. They don't respect opinions or ideas. They don't listen. Well, they're arrogant, just random things like that. And she really connected this, this feeling of hyper competition. Um, competition is supposed to motivate students to perform better, but in this toxic hyper, hyperactive state, it really just creates a sense of, of fragmentation and, and envy. Fergie uh, also talks about something similar. She says um, uh, about, really about the lack of social connection. She says, you know, that social, I don't know, bonding and getting together just did not happen. It was really frustrating. Everyone always talks about when you first get to grad school, you always have to plan for the meltdown. Okay, that really made me sad when she first said that, by the way, my heart stopped about the meltdown, uh, because it'll be one, whether you want it to happen or not. I think for the most part, my meltdown happened not because of classes and the stress of adjusting to the level of work that it takes to be a grad student, but the fact that I didn't have anyone to share my frustrations with. Even the good days, there was just nobody there. So what have we learned from this project? <laughs> or, and, and what can we do, right? I think that's something that's really important. For us, I think this project really creates, uh, provides this very situated understanding, um, localized understanding of how institutional ideologies at the macro level, departmental policies at the meso level, and interpersonal dynamics at the micro level really intersect to form sometimes a culture of stress and toxicity for graduate students. And it suggests that a more local and field specific approach um, might, uh, and perhaps complementing uh, in institutional top down measures, uh, could help develop more effective institutional resources. And so here are a few suggestions um, that, we, that we sort of came up with based on the data that we found. Uh, universities can provide better targeted support forums and messages for graduate students in various disciplines. 
departments, not just the overall university, but departments should institute specific and transparent rules and policies on disbursing key resources and, and how they make their decisions. Administrators should adopt and enforce zero tolerance on departmental politics that basically can harm graduate students. Subscription and inducements to use extra organizational resources like the NCFDD, which I know Wayne State um, has, and I, I've used it and I found it really, really helpful. Departments code, it should also co-develop professional development programs with professional associations. And this is something that a lot of professional associations have been doing for a long time. Although I don't know that a lot of departments and universities actually collaborate with associations to, 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 to develop their own programs. I know the National Communication Association, um, NCA is one that is really, really actively trying to develop these, uh, these sort of programs to support graduate students as well as faculty. Another, um, some other uh, points for discussion <clears throat> would be that this project for us really emphasized um, the hidden discrimination that sometimes we don't really even think about, stemming from race, gender, national origin, language or accent, research area, methodology, mentor identity, um, and, and a whole host of other factors that we don't necessarily think about, or that we might perhaps dismiss as, oh, it's just, uh, you know, not everyone has to get along together. Uh, when people don't get along together and that results in an active derailing of, of professional activity, unfortunately, that, that's a huge problem. <clears throat> which means that there's a need for administrators and graduate student organizations to come together to build meaningful support networks for students. And, and that means we also have to be a little careful that it doesn't devolve into that co-remination um, that we talked about earlier, that there is support, but there is support towards, um, to, to, towards really uh, empathy and sympathy and, and productive solutions. Um, at the end of the day, I think our project, what we try to do is that we try to reaffirm, on the one hand, graduate students agency, as well as administrators responsibility to reconsider the status quo. And this means changing things up, both on a personal sense and a professional sense. Uh, sense. Just because things have always been done this, the way in a particular way, doesn't mean that they're the best way. And, and um, believe me, just being a part and hearing some of these stories has, has made me just so uh, aware of that. <clears throat> so what, what are some suggestions over here? Um, administrators can streamline policies on reporting discriminatory practices and supporting mentorship resources, especially for students of color. Graduate students can organize workshops on tokenism and stereotyping and social gatherings to downplay toxic hypercompetition. A couple of years ago, some graduate students from, um, they were not all from the communication department, but um, I think um, a few prominent members uh, were, uh, they, and, and, they, and they reached out to uh, Marquita as well as uh, the others in the administration. We had the first diversity pre-conference uh, for graduate students here at Wayne State, which was, which was amazing, I think. And so we need to see more of those kinds of events and situations and social gatherings that, that highlight really um, um, the solidarity on the one hand and to downplay this, this form of toxicity. Um, administrators and graduate student organizations can collaborate on drafting graduate student mission statements and bills of rights and responsibilities. Um, and, um, uh, and this actually comes um, to us from uh, my colleague, uh, Patrice Bazanel at the University of South Florida, which, doesn't, which is not unionized, does not have a graduate student union, and yet they actually have um, their graduate students association, both at the general university level, as well as at the department level, works with administrators at the department and at the university level to create a bill of rights and responsibilities for both faculty, as well as administrators, as well as graduate students as well. Administrators should invest time and resources to support meaningful socialization events to address these diverse lived experiences as well. 
And finally, <clears throat> um, you know, keep, keeping in line, keeping in realizing that I think a lot of times faculty probably have the best intentions at heart, but sometimes we might not know how to do things any more different than what we have, you know, undergone in our own sort of graduate careers. It becomes really important to have training for faculty on, on how we can actually cultivate supportive and compassionate environments for our mentees and our research team members. At the same time, um, we can extend training on peer mentoring best practices for graduate students as well, because there is no hard and fast rule that faculty are the only mentors that graduate students should have in, in, in grad school. Oh, all right, this is, I guess I still had the old slide over, but uh, I'm gonna stop sharing <laughs> because this last slide is not relevant. And uh, that's it, thank you so much. If there were any questions or comments, you can um, use the reaction button to raise your hand and I can unmute you. Um, I believe the chat is still disabled, but. Um, if there weren't any questions, Dr. Edwards, did you have any comments that you wanted to say? Oh, there's, there's a hand, there's a hand, uh, Anna. Lindner, she's uh, just raise her hand. Let me see. Uh, let me see. I, I can unmute her. So she's unmuted. Um, Anna, I go. was just clapping for the for Rahul's uh, <laughs> presentation. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> well, if there weren't any comments or questions, I just wanted to say thank. Oh. Yes. Yes, I'm, sure. I'm sure there are some comments. I just wanted to thank Raul for that very good um, presentation. It was very thorough and very clear. And uh, I learned some things from, um, from your data and for, from your analysis. And I'll be uh, thinking uh, differently about, um, I don't have a lot of PhD students, but I have um, other graduate students. And um, so uh, you gave me um, some things to, to think about um that i um hadn't thought about before so thank you so thank you holly for that comment i also want to say by the way that um, our data was not only only relevant for phd students we did have a large number of master students as well and one of the other things that people actually talked about was how in a lot of programs they felt actively looked down upon as master students in, in, in joint programs. And they're like, well, there's a different, there's a different set of rules for PhD students and we are not considered you know, in that same category. And, and again, that's the sort of thing that really messes up with your sense of self and, um, and, and capacity to think that you are not capable of even engaging in, in that kind of a, of a, of, of a, of, of a conversation. So. So, so yeah, a lot of the themes that I just talked about uh, do not apply only to PhD programs. Uh, we had programs that were master's only, PhD only, joint PhD masters. So they're really across the board, but thank you. If I could, I just was um, thinking um, of, a, of another um, question, which was, um, were you able to share um, your findings with the participants in this particular study or any of your um, doc students and master students that you have now? And what was their reaction to the findings? Did they say, oh yeah, yeah, now you guys, now you've got it. Or what was their, what's been the follow-up? So we, I actually used the data as, um, as, um, as the exercise for a qualitative research methods grad seminar. Um, and so we had about, I think we had 12 students and they all poured through the data and they were all like, oh my God, this is the story of my life. I'm like, yep, you know, I, and, I'm, and I'm sorry that it is the story of your life and I hope we can change that, right? Um, so so uh, we had at least 12 students who poured through the data, you know, themselves. Um, and you saw three of them listed with this talk because they um, really, you know, did this. We have another set of three students who we, I work with for the other manuscript that is under under uh, review. Um, and 
Yeah, we, so this was also shared at a conference at, at, at NCA and we um, to, um, um, submitted a white paper to NCA as well, based on this as well to, to the funders. So yeah, we're, we're definitely trying as much as we can to share um, the, the, the findings. Raul, did you share these uh, findings with the graduate student organizations that we have on campus here? And so like places like the, like the Office for Teaching and Learning, I think um, those, those, those units should, should, should find this material interesting, at least um, to, to at least make, to make comments on. I have not, but I, I'd be glad to. I just, you know, haven't done, done that. But absolutely, if you can, if, if you would connect me with uh, uh, the relevant people, I will be glad to send them a PDF or Word document or whatever they're going to find helpful. Um, absolutely. There is a, there's a pretty vigorous um, graduate student organization in the, on, on campus. They, they interact with uh, the senior vice, senior uh, vice provost, vice provost and so on. So yeah, it should be, should be easy to contact, contact them. Um, or at least um, post uh, your, your work in a visible place so that people can know what it is. I mean, in, in our um, efforts to publicize your talk, at least, uh, the person responsible for publication was expected to put it on um, social media, but also on the university website. And if it did get on the university website, it should be. I see that Adrian Jenkins has a hands raised. Hi, thank you so much for sharing all of this. Um, it has me thinking about in the English department, um, some of the work we've done on structuring um, mentoring and peer mentoring programs and like building, um, building that both into documents, like teaching observation processes and into um, different uh, opportunities, but how in the last couple of years, some of that structure is, it's just lost because of the lack of opportunity to do that kind of mentoring always in like the kinds of uh, academic timeline we used to do it like at orientation, face-to-face -face or whatever. Um, so I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on um, the ways that, I, I can only imagine that, that your findings would be, have been compounded in students' experiences over the last couple of years. Um, do you have any thoughts on the ways that mentoring structures and departmental structures will, will need to like tune into bounce back or adapt in the next, you know, to, to get back to something good or, or, or to get to something good at all. <laughs> right. <clears throat> um, I know, I mean, um, I have a student actually who is, who is here uh, in, the, in the room. Thank you for joining Ali. Um, and I was just talking with Ali the other day on, on, uh, on Zoom and, and I, I marvel that although we've worked together for this is her second year of coursework, we have actually never met face to face, and and that was just such a profound realization, right? And so we we've, we've um, so after having a realization, I think I reached out to all of my graduate students and said, "Hey, we are going to have a get together at my house because we need to see each other after two after uh, you know two years, pretty much." Um, and you know, I, I I think, but but that's part of the problem in when you know if 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 we are entirely dependent and in, you know on individual faculty members to do this, right? It's a lot of it's a lot it's a lot, and you know if, even my participants recognize that it's a lot, and so um, it it would be wonderful if we had something much more streamlined, right? Um, and I recognize that. In the past, a lot of departments had um, in-person gatherings, uh, colloquiums and sessions and workshop sessions. A lot of graduate student organizations had them as well, right? 
Um, and I think some, some organizations have continued uh, or have been able to pivot successfully uh, to an online format for some of those. Um, whereas others, unfortunately, because, you know, of, like I said, the emotional burnout issue and, and people, I think it was a time when people just could not take another Zoom meeting <laughs> and understandably so. And so a lot of, a lot of, unfortunately, some of those structures sort of fell by the wayside. And so I think we have an opportunity now as we sort of sort of make this transition back to on campus, recognizing that there are some things that we can make this transition in a meaningful way, um, uh, but also recognizing that not, not, that, not that, sorry, I'm stuttering, that um, in order for it to be meaningful, it doesn't always have to be an in-person kind of a format either, right? Because again, if we have that sort of in-person requirement right away, it, it, it all, it, that can also exclude a lot of folks who might have healthcare or childcare or other issues going forward. And so I think we'll, we'll have to be a little flexible in terms of the format, but you know, we can't entirely throw the baby out of the bathwater, so to speak. I think it's, it's important to sort of rejuvenate some of those structures, maybe rethink some of those structures, which in the past you know, were only on a Friday or a Thursday at 4 p.m. And you know, too bad if you had class or you had a meeting, you couldn't attend, and there was no way of you know, recording it or even going back to it. I think those are some of those um, mindful conversations um, and policies that we should be revisiting in each of our departments. And, and this does need to be, I think, the, the responsibility of not just one person, right? Not, not, not the person who's on the diversity committee <laughs> in, 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 in your department or in your college. It, it needs to be something that the entire faculty member uh, group sort of needs to come together and say, yeah, we kind of need to do this for everyone's sanity and, and thriving. Thank you. <laughs> okay. I don't see anybody else's hands up. So Jacqueline has a little spiel. <laughs> <which she gives. laughs> I just wanted to say thank you for everyone for coming to attend this talk. And thank you, Dr. Mitra, for this very informative, um, very important um, discussion and sharing your research with us. Um, you can tell your passion for um, making academia um, an equal supportive space is, is there. And I, even when I had you as a professor, I saw it in your teaching. So thank you so much. The Humanity Center wanted to give you a journal and a caddy with our logo on it as a way to say thank you. And when, when I get back to campus, I'll reach out to you to see how I can get it to you. Um, absolutely. And as for everyone else, um, and you, Dr. Mitra, uh, this recording will be available on our YouTube channel and on our website shortly. So look for it, look for it there if you would like to share it with anyone. Thank you, everyone, and have a great rest of your day.